The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, welcome to today's webinar. We're pleased to have you join us. Um, today's webinar will be focused on perspectives on energy justice, views from the UK, India, and Myanmar. Um, and we're pleased to welcome three excellent speakers today. Um, as we mentioned, this grows out of the recent uh, event of the Low Carbon Energy for Development Network um, at Durham University. Um, so each of these three people uh, spoke there on panels. Um, so first of all, we have Dr. Rosie Day, Senior Lecturer of Environment and Society from the University of Birmingham. Next, we'll have Dr. Shika Lakanpal, from the Ashoka Trust for Research and Ecology and the Environment, or ACRE, from India. And then thirdly, we'll have Ms. Dipti Vagela, who's a Fulbright Public Policy Fellow based in Myanmar. So today, we'd like to encourage you to be interactive, to please send in your questions as the panelists are talking. Let us know who your question is for, and that'll better help us to inform um, the Q&A session at the end of today. Um, and as well, so one of the things that I'd like to suggest as well is that if you do want to connect with us on social media, let me just give you our Twitter addresses. So that's E4 Smart Villages, 4 Smart Villages, and that's at UKLCEDN for LCEDN's email account. Um, and I'll, as always, this is co-hosted between LCEDN and Smart Villages. Um, so what I'd like to do here first is actually do a couple of quick polls of the audience um, to get a better idea of who we have here today and where you guys are based. Um, so if you'll humor me, I will do a first poll here asking where you are based. So let me just launch that poll and I'll give you a few seconds to fill that in. Um, so are you based perhaps in Latin America and the Caribbean, Africa, Europe or the Middle East, Asia Pacific or North America? Go ahead and fill in that poll. Thanks for joining us here today from all these different uh, regions around the world and for this topic of energy justice, which has so many, uh, so many implications for all of those regions. Okay, great. Well, it looks like most people have voted, so let me go ahead and close that poll. And I'm going to share that with you so that you can um, see that. And so just to show you that, um, we have... So we don't have anyone right now from Latin America and the Caribbean. It might still be a little too early for them, understandably. Um, although we do have some folks from North America. Um, we don't have anybody on the line from Africa today, which is a real shame. Um, but I hope some more will, people will join in um, a little bit later in the broadcast. Um, we also have 50% um, of the people from Europe and the Middle East, 25% from Asia and Pacific, and 25% from North America. Great. Thanks so much for, for voting on that particular poll. Let me do another quick poll here. This is about your professional background. Um, so it's to get to know you all just a little bit better. Um, so are you working perhaps in the public sector? Um, are you working in the private sector or maybe as an entrepreneur? Are you an academic or working um, in research? And perhaps you're working for an NGO or a nonprofit. So thanks a lot for going ahead, going ahead and filling that in and letting us know. So I'll give you just a few more seconds to, um, to vote there. Okay, great. Let me go ahead and close that poll and I'll share the results with you guys. Okay, fantastic. So sharing that with you. So unfortunately, we don't have any policymakers um, from the public sector here on the line, uh, which is a shame. But again, we're doing a recording of this, so that can also be shared with them afterwards. Um, we have 14 percent coming from the private sector, 64 percent from research and academia. That's probably our biggest percentage there ever. So I think that's a, a thanks to thanks to the um, LCEDN conference recently and and those networks, um, and 21% from NGOs and nonprofits. Okay, that's great. Thanks, everybody, for voting in those polls. Um, so what I'd like to do next is actually just go directly to our, our first presenter. So let me go ahead and get her on the line and also bring up her presentation. So if you'll bear with us just one second here, we will... Hi, Rosie. Are you there on the line? Hi. I am here. Wonderful. Wonderful. So... Um, I can see your presentation, so and now it's full screen, which is perfect. So without any further ado, I'll let you launch into your presentation. Thanks for joining us here today. 
Okay, thanks Molly for the introduction. So it, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be the first speaker today. I'm, um, I'm speaking to you from Birmingham, UK. Um, so the point of my presentation really is to give an introduction to the idea of energy justice and it's, it's a more conceptual presentation using, using some examples along the way. So just to start off with what exactly energy justice is, and I'm having a little bit of trouble with my keys here. I don't know what's happened. Um, okay, I'm just going to have to come out of that a moment because for some reason... Oh, that's no problem. Yeah. Sorry, my screen's frozen. My keyboard's frozen. I'm oh dear, okay. i the webinar, but I'm well, not no able worries. to move my slides. This is, this is not our first technical uh, technical problem. Do you want to try closing out the PowerPoint and just reopening it, if it'll allow you to I'm sorry, do that? but I'm afraid it's frozen. Oh dear. Um, I can't actually get out of the PowerPoint at all. Can you try um, Control-Alt-Delete? Yeah, good point, okay. Um, sure, if that's going to help. Um, okay, sorry about this. Do you want to put me on mute or anything, Molly? Or ah, do you want to... No, that's no problem, that's there? no problem. I know the audience... Ah, okay, is I can now get out of it. Um, so let me try again and okay. see if that might have just opened things up and maybe I can... Yes, sure. so... Perfect. It's now working. Sorry about that. No <laughs> worries. No that. worries. We always have some hiccups. No it's problem. A strange thing. So, no worries. Right. Starting with what is this idea of energy justice? So, at its most basic way of thinking about it, I think it's quite straightforwardly it's concerns about social justice and social inequalities applied to energy systems. So, we might also think of it as fairness, whether energy systems are functioning in a fair way. So it's concerned with addressing social inequalities in who benefits from energy systems, who doesn't benefit, who might pay the associated costs of energy systems. It includes aspects of energy production and energy consumption. So we might look across the whole system or we might be looking at any parts of an energy system at any given time. So as well as energy itself, energy per se and energy services that we might use, it also includes thinking about linked concerns, for example, the pollution that might arise from energy production, employment associated with energy industry and access to land which might be affected by energy development. I should mention that some scholars also include environmental considerations in, in, under energy justice. So when you're reading around energy justice, you might find that people are including ideas about sustainability and perhaps justice to the environment. That's not the way I tend to approach it. I tend to approach it very much from a social justice point of view. And I would see those other concerns as, as important, but linked and perhaps better thought of as in energy ethics or sort of linked concerns about sustainability and ethics. But I'm flagging that up so that, you know, you'll understand that there are different views on this and you might see slightly different frameworks going on. So some of the questions that we might think about, and I'm afraid my keyboard has frozen again, so I'm going to do the same thing I did before, and hopefully that will sort it out. No, it hasn't sorted it out. Um, okay, if I do this and this, and then back, has that? Yes, it has. Perfect. Okay, I'll know what to do again if it happens again. So I'm just flagging up some things that we might think about under this aegis of energy justice, the kinds of things that people are focused on. So fairly familiar ideas perhaps about inequality of access to energy and the differential impacts on people's health that we might be used to thinking about with energy poverty. We might look at things like the differential use of energy services. So for example, um, from the LCD EDN conference, there are examples of women not having access to mobile phones, although the infrastructure was there for those to be charged. So that might be thought of as, as a, an inequality in energy service access. Questions about displacement of people when large scale energy developments are taking place. Questions about the distribution of profits and benefits from energy developments compared with the distribution of the costs and impacts. We might be concerned with things like the adequacy of information on energy related issues, the costs of energy and information about energy developments, the extent to which people have a voice in energy policy, and also perhaps things like the safety of appliances and fuels and energy infrastructures. So there's quite a lot going on there. And one thing that really helps in doing research and scholarship on energy justice is to have a good conceptual framework. 
And the framework that we tend to use has really, I would say, built on work that's happened in environmental justice. So um, I have provided a few references later, and one of the references I provided is David Schlossberg, which is a very good one on concepts of environmental justice, and this really applies to energy justice as well. So one of the foundational building blocks is the idea of distributional justice, and this is really concerned with how things are distributed between people and groups and whether distributions are fair. They may or may not be equal, but um, questions about whether they're fair or not are a little bit more complicated. And then linked with distributional justice, we have the concept of procedural justice. And as the name suggests, this is really concerned with procedures of perhaps policy making, procedures of allocation, and other concerns linked to do with the provision of information and so on as well. So theorists that we might think about, so these are very interrelated, because if procedures are not good, then it tends to lead to unfair distribution. So if people aren't included in decision making and aren't thought about and aren't given the right information, then you tend to get unfair and unjust outcomes. So that's what these arrows are about. There's a bit of feedback as well. So in scholarship, we of course draw on theorists and the theorists that we've tended to draw on are theorists in political philosophy and social justice theory. So John Rawls being a very famous one on distributional justice, others as well, Amartya Sen I find very useful about capabilities. People who've written about procedural justice include Iris Marion Young, very important, Kristen schrader fischett and the Aarhus Convention, which is actually about environmental decision making, is a very good point of reference for different facets of procedural justice. And then as scholarship's gone on, then it's drawn rather more on a different concept of social justice, which is usually termed the idea of recognition. So this is a bit different because justice as recognition is a relational and intersubjective view of justice. And this sees social justice as rooted in the respect that is accorded to different groups of people. And injustice might occur when there's systematic denigration and devaluing of specific groups of people, perhaps on the grounds of gender, race, ethnicity, and so on. So it's that kind of relational inequality that this is getting at. And then theorists that are usually referred to there include Nancy Fraser, Iris Marin Young again, Axel Honneth in Germany, and Charles Taylor. So justice as recognition, I think we can really think of as underpinning the other forms of justice. So if people are not recognised, if they're not given equal status, if they're not given respect, then that often means that they do not receive, um, they're not um, thought about in distributions and they don't get fair share of whatever important goods are being distributed. And again, if people are not given equal status and equal respect, then they're often marginalised in procedures and decision making and therefore their point of view isn't heard and their voice isn't heard at all. And there are some feedbacks from these as well, because if people don't have access to resources, then they tend to stay lower status and so on. I've also added into this framework spatial injustice, because this is something that's also discussed in energy justice literature. I've linked that there with the idea of distributional justice, because spatial injustice is generally talking about the distribution of things across space. So it might be for example, the distribution of energy resources across space, or it might be the use of space for energy infrastructures. But it's it's a kind of another take on distributional justice, I would say. And quite important theorists there would be David Harvey and Sergio, who are both geographers. So it's not surprising really that geography is quite interested in spatial, the spatial aspects of distributional justice. So I hope that's helpful as a conceptual framework, but to link those concepts back to some of these questions we might be asking. In energy justice. Hopefully you can see how these might pan out. So distributional energy justice questions would include things like who has access to energy and to energy services, how are the benefits and costs of energy enterprises and energy developments distributed between individuals, between households and groups of people. So this might include things like the distribution of pollution as well. Spatial justice questions, as I say, linked to that, but with a more spatial idea. So how is access to energy and energy services distributed across space? And how are rights to space, such as rights to land, affected by energy development? Procedural justice questions in the energy justice realm would include who has influence in energy policy and energy decisions at different scales, who's in, excluded from, proceeds from procedures and decision making and why are they being excluded? and is the information that people receive adequate and who does it reach? 
And then if we think in terms of this other idea of justice as recognition, then that leads us to ask questions more about whose energy needs are paid attention to. So who is, is perhaps seen as important and who is not seen as important, whose needs are being ignored. This might be questions of whether customs and cultures are being accommodated. Are energy systems and energy appliances designed suitably to suit a range of diverse needs? And is everyone's safety being respected in how things are designed and maintained? So having set those out separately, of course, they do often combine when we're looking at real world situations. So if I just briefly use one example um, from India, which is a study that I worked on with a very good PhD student called Kamali Yanetti, and I've given some references to her papers later. So this work was about the large scale Charanika solar park in, in India, in Gujarat. And through her analysis, um, she found that the distribution of benefits from this large scale solar generation was rather unfair. So the benefits in terms of income and money generation were going to the state, to private investors, perhaps to the nation as a whole in terms of having clean energy. And you could say they were also global in that this large scale clean energy development was benefiting um, globally in terms of reducing carbon emissions or not increasing carbon emissions too much. But the community itself did, that was hosting this did not benefit so much. So although some sectors of the community were able to, to um, gain some jobs and to generate some income out of it, most of the community actually didn't benefit and they actually lost the use of land as well. So access to land was very limited. So there were distributional and spatial injustices there. There were procedural justice issues in that the villages where this development took place were not really given enough information about the event that the development would take place and were therefore not able to perhaps make use of the information to sell land at a suitable price and so on. And there were recognition issues in that the people who were particularly affected were pastoralists, the robbery herders. So there was a particular group of people who were excluded and marginalised and actually bore the biggest costs in that they lost the use of the common land that they'd previously been using before as livelihoods. So that example just really serves as one that shows that all of these dimensions often come together. And what's important is that the overall effect also often acts to reinforce existing inequalities. That's not necessarily always the case, but it is often the case that energy injustice does work along the same lines as wider sets of injustice and it tends to reinforce those existing inequalities. So I want to briefly, in the few minutes that I have left, offer a few more reflections on energy justice. So the first is, there's four of them, the first is that energy justice and injustice has both material and social dimensions. So I think we're often accustomed to, think, to thinking of energy and energy systems as quite material things, you know, energy infrastructures and so on. And of course, there is that aspect, fuels, appliances, land, how appliances are designed, maintenance, safety, these are all quite material aspects. But these material objects are always working within social systems. So the social impacts, the social aspects would include rights of access, rights to use, needs being taken into account, as I mentioned, and participation and representation. So I would say that energy justice and injustice it involves the organisation of materials, but it's fundamentally a social and political problem and it has to be tackled on that basis of social and political solutions. The second reflection, a little bit connected, is that energy justice isn't a fixed property of a system, but it requires ongoing attention. So there are material aspects, as we said, um, and some of these might be thought of as fixed, such as where wind turbines are, where solar panels might be put, but at the same time, those things also need to be maintained. So there are ongoing issues about whether that's done, who it's done by, who bears the costs and so on. We might think of policy and legislation as a form of, of a sort of fixed part of the system, but of course they always have to be enacted. And we know that policies and legislation are not necessarily enacted equally in different places and over time. And things like participation obviously have to be ongoing. So there's a there's a kind of ongoing and dynamic aspect to this. So whilst it is good to do energy justice audits and analyses at the planning stage of projects, they also have to have to have an eye to the temporal dimension and how systems are going to work on an ongoing basis. Third reflection is that energy justice requires thinking at different scales, but it can also involve a politics of scale. 
So fairly obviously communities of justice can be drawn at different scales. If we're concerned about gender, we might be looking at the household scale, about the distribution of energy services and labour and our decision making within households. At the community level, we might be looking at who has access to infrastructure services, who pays for them and so on. Cities are obviously a bigger scale and more complex again, and larger institutions become involved, plans and policies. And we can also think of energy justice at a global scale. For example, this is a map of the distribution of access to electricity. And then if we're thinking in terms of climate justice and the effects of carbon emissions, and obviously that also includes thinking at a global scale. So different scales of analyses are important. But there are also, there's also can be a politics to the scale at which the questions are drawn. So I don't have time to expand on that now, but it's just to make that point that we often have to think across scales and to think about processes at different scales. And the final point that I want to make is just that energy justice isn't a bounded field. So it's become something that we talk about as separate, but it's very connected to issues of housing, of materials, of transport, work, labour, how people cook, how people live to the environment, of course, and to the climate. So it's really important to remember that energy justice is connected to all of these other fields. And often what is happening is that there's a more fundamental set of justice questions and inequalities. And energy justice is perhaps a symptom of that and therefore very much connected to how these inequalities work out in other areas as well. So I realise I come to the end of my time. So I'm not going to read through my conclusions, but I have drawn a set of conclusions there. I've given my contact email at the bottom if anybody wants to follow up with me. And on the final slide, because I realised that people are going to be given the slides, I've also put an example set of references. There's quite a lot of reading that can be found, but I thought that those might be some useful starting points. So I think that's my time up. So that's all from me for now. Thank you so much, Rosie. I mean, I, I think that's really useful. Um, and of course, we'll come back in the Q&A, but it's really useful to have this kind of framework kind of laid out so that when we're hearing uh, the contributions of, of Shika and Dipti next, um, we can be thinking about those different, um, those different uh, types of, of energy justice and the, those different areas that you're pointing out, especially in your reflection. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. So um, for our next speaker, um, that is going to be Shika Lakanpal. Let me go ahead and bring her online um, and also uh, invite her to share her slides. Hi, Shika, are you there? Hi, Shika, I think you're still on mute. So um, yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah, great. Hi, can you Hi. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, so, great. Sorry about that. I didn't realize that I had to unmute the microphone. So. <laughs> That's no no problem, no problem. Um, so we're really interested to kind of hear, you know, kind of as a as a follow up to to this this um, framework that Rosie has just laid out. You know, how your experience with Ashoka in in, in India um, will contribute to that. And thanks a lot for joining us here today. Right, thanks. Thanks, Molly, and thanks to um, all the participants today for joining us at this webinar. And also a special thanks to Rosie because she laid out the framework uh, so clearly, and especially the example from India that she mentioned with the large solar park and that how it had it played out differently for different actors across uh, scale and so on. So my the example that I'm going to present today will resonate with um, a lot of the, uh, the things that Rosie just uh, made clear for all of us. So I'm here to talk about um, contesting renewable energy in India. And uh, so this is about an opposition to a small hydropower project that is located in uh, one of the prime biodiversity hotspots uh, in the western part of India. So quite uh, sort of at the broad scale, it looks at trade-offs between biodiversity, livelihoods, and energy. But the larger question that uh, this piece tries to address is how are geographies of renewable energy shaped? So my uh, aim today is to lay out the politics around uh, this conflict and to understand that how and why were actors that were either for renewable energy project or they were against it. And then in the process is try and understand the implications for what does it tell us about geographies of renewable energy. So I'm going to just uh, launch into the case by presenting a little bit of information about India's renewable energy context, 
So in India is now the seventh largest um, in terms of renewable energy capacity worldwide. Uh, wind power sector has been one of the leading sectors in renewable energy in India, but uh, small hydropower is second only to wind. And as you can see, India's have, India has seen an astronomical rise in renewable energy capacity from 2003 onwards all the way till uh, 2017. And I would like to point your attention to 2003 with the Electricity Act of 2003. That was a national level act, a legislation that devolved renewable policy making to state level nodal agencies, uh, which then, so the state level nodal agencies are now responsible for um, putting together the policy for renewable energy at the state level in India. They're responsible for developing a market for renewable energy, and they also assist private actors or private players who want to set up renewable energy projects in terms of facilitating land acquisition, um, getting them a host of no objection certificates and so on. So this is important to understand in, in, you know, in, in terms of who makes these decisions about energy and where renewable energy plants are, projects are to be set up and so on. So moving forward. Uh, this is a quote from the National Mission on Small Hydropower, which was um, recently set in motion by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy at the federal scale in India. And I have put this quote here to try and understand the justification that small hydropower projects, which are considered renewable and therefore they come under the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. Uh, this is the kind of justification that is given to propagate small hydropower projects in India. And uh, just to give you a bit of a technical background, run of the river means that they construct a tunnel uh, which diverts the water from the river. And then using the natural gradient of the land, the water is uh, sort of thrown on turbines, electricity is generated, and the water is then uh, released back into the river stream. So on paper, it sounds very good, but technically you literally have to clear a lot of land. You have to build power evacuation arrangements, like a substation for power, you have to, of course, put the infrastructure for the transmission and distribution lines. So it's um, and it's not a simple case, case of just taking the water from the river and putting it back in because you, the construction of tunnels and canals sort of affects the water flow and so on. But of course, in this sort of justification or narrative or in comparison with large dams, uh, these kind of ecological and social and political contestations are often hidden. So I'll launch straight ahead into the case study. Uh, this is from the southwestern state of Karnataka in India, and we'll just quickly look at a map to see where that is. So as you can see, this is sort of uh, a coastal area, part of the western coast of India. And the case study, uh, the site for the small hydropower project is located just 100 kilometers inland from the coast, uh, from the south part of the state. So this is important to understand because right along the western coast of India, there is the Western Ghats, which, as you can see, runs parallel to the coast. This is um, considered to be a prime area for biodiversity and, in fact, is um, one of the world's topmost eight hottest hotspots for biodiversity. And it supports a range of flora and fauna. And uh, so there is a sort of, um, you know, a need to, which is propagated at the national level and also at local and regional scales, is to protect this area from any sort of destructive development and so on. So it is against this backdrop that the small hydropower project was planned at the confluence of two major rivers in South India in the southwestern state of Karnataka. And uh, this project, um, although and it's less than 25 megawatts in capacity, which is what makes it uh, quote unquote small. And India considers all projects that are under 25 megawatts to be small and hence they come under the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, and in comparison to large dams, which is any hydropower project that is above 25 megawatts is under the Ministry of Power. So this um, project is located uh, at the site of confluence of two tributaries uh, of this major river, Netravati, and there are three local uh, elected village councils uh, that are opposing the project, and there is one local village elected council that is in favor of the project. Now, the people who are opposing the project have refused to give the no objection certificate to the project proponents because they believe that it is going to affect the irrigation and cultivation of their lands. Specifically, uh, they believe it's going to affect about 123 hectares of uh, rubber, 
and areca plantations, cocoa, um, and cashew nuts, which is the main crop from the region. And there is also a reserve forest that is wedged between the two rivers. So um, even though the imposing threat uh, that is from the project for the local people is loss of livelihoods, and that's why they're opposing the project, but uh, they, uh, the people sort of made an alliance with conservationists and they were able to strategically align themselves with conservationists and successfully oppose the small hydropower project. For the people who are for the local elected council that is supporting the project, they are doing so simply because uh, they see that it's going to bring local development into the area. And so this, he is the uh, leader of the conflict, uh, the uh, protest uh, movement against the project. And uh, quite interestingly, uh, like I said before, since they forged an alliance with conservationists and they realized that the arguments about livelihoods are probably not going to get them so much traction as when they make the case about uh, biodiversity. And um, it is very interesting for when I went into the field to find out that at the local scale, this is not a question about renewable energy versus biodiversity. In fact, the fact that the project is a renewable or considered sustainable was not even uh, you know, something that the local villagers considered at the local scale. So the sustainable development discourse, uh, the actors who are for or against the project at the local scale don't use any of the justification for sustainability. Rather, it's about uh, development versus environment at the local scale. And it is only uh, when uh, you, know, you zoom out of the local scale into higher scales that people who are on either side of the conflict start using the justification and locating it in the global discourse of sustainability. So, uh, and also I sort of very quickly wanted to mention the development context of the village. So these people are not too far away from the big city of Bangalore, which I'm sure most of you will know as the Silicon Valley of India. The sons, for example, of the, uh, the person who's leading the agitation, his sons are engineers, they study in the city of Bangalore. So they have networks with urban practitioners, uh, professors, researchers who study conservation and so on. In the city of Bangalore, uh, there is electricity already in these villages, there are good paved roads, schools are nearby and so on. So the development context of the village also plays a role because it gives the people the capacity to say no to outside external project members and say that they don't want development outcomes, rather uh, would like to protect their livelihoods. So this is the section of uh, the project where the project members had started construction, but then they uh, you know, received a stay order uh, from the local authorities and the state level authorities to not proceed with construction. And I would just quickly like to highlight as to how about the, how is it that the stay order came about? So the local people, of course, they approached some journalists and conservation actors and so on. And very quickly from the city of Bangalore, which is not too far away from this site, uh, conservation experts descended upon the local site and they quickly discovered some new fish in the river and some trees and the reserve forest uh, were sort of seen as prime biodiversity hotspots. And they um, urged the local people to approach UNFCCC and to write to the UNFCCC to not to give CDM approval, that's the Clean Development Mechanism approval, to the small hydropower project on the basis of biodiversity. So even though the local people were threatened by the project due to loss of livelihoods, they very quickly encroach and case their arguments in the logic of biodiversity and they wrote to actors at higher global scales, which then promulgated or rather pushed the state level authorities to uh, put a stay order on construction of this project. So this is a quote from um, the local activist Pradeep who very clearly, Cradle is the state level nodal agency. And they said that, you know, when the conflict was about livelihoods, it was not really uh, a matter of concern for the state authorities, but for the big international organization, which is located at the global scale, like the UNFCCC and the national ministry, they had to highlight the biodiversity angle. So just very quickly, by way of conclusion, I just want to say that this, this contestation around renewable energy sort of appears to have different forms look, uh, depending on the politics of scale or the scale at which you st study the conflict. So at the local level, it is a clear conflict between environment versus development. 
Uh, but as you go on to the higher scales, you know, speak to actors which are located at either the state level or the national or the global level, the conflict morphs from environment versus development to environment versus environment. And the local movements that are around, that are contesting renewable energy, sort of, they are nested or rather influenced by the larger politics of environment and development. And as the larger politics of environment and development shifts to include projects such as renewable energy, which are located in areas of prime biodiversity, the local movements also adapt and strategize accordingly. And therefore they have, they seem to have the characteristic of being ideologically hybrid or malleable in the sense that they're able to draw upon different discourses as and when the need arises to push for um, things that work for them. And I put my email here for anybody who may have uh, additional questions or if you just want to know more about my work and uh, I'll be happy to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shika. Thanks. I mean, I think that's a really, um, to, to follow up our first presentation from Rosie, I think that's a really great uh, case study and also looking at all of those elements that she was mentioning of the different types of, um, different types of rights and the different uh, approaches to uh, energy justice, especially from the ground level, like the, the case that you've just shared with us. So thank you so much, Shika. Thank you. So great. So now we are going to move over to um, to Dipti Vagela, um, Fulbright Policy Fellow, and I'm just going to request her to share her screen with us. And hi, Dipti, are you there on the line? Hi, Dipti. I think I might have lost um, lost my ability to hear you. Let me see. Um, can you try saying something? Or can you still hear me, hopefully? Hi, Dipti. Can you still can you still hear me? Just checking here um, about whether whether my mic's working or were your your mic's working. Hi, Molly. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. I can hear you now. Okay, brilliant. So, okay. So wonderful. Well, I think uh, with no further ado, um, we will ask you, I see your, your presentation's up there. It's, um, it's perfect. So um, with no further ado, I'll let you launch into your work in Myanmar. Great. Thank you. I'm glad to join this webinar. Thanks so much for um, having me share. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a Fulbright Public Policy Fellow based in Yangon with the Renewable Energy Association of Myanmar uh, that works uh, to bridge government and international actors to local actors, which include private sector communities and various CSOs in the region. To start with, um, a little over 30% of Myanmar is electrified with the main grid and to obtain universal access, the government has received a loan from the World Bank um, of $400 million. And this is, this is great news, right? It's good for the country and, and for its development. Um, however, the key gaps that we are trying to address is that um, the least cost analysis uh, that was done to determine how uh, Myanmar should be electrified 100% didn't include the existing renewable energy mini grids, which um, which are quite um, at, done at scale. Um, so these 6,000 plus renewable energy mini grids um, have been done over the last 30 years. Yet the current policy. Uh, sandwiches, um, mini grids are sandwiched between a big focus on subsidized solar home lighting and large scale infrastructure. And there, of course, is a lot of international influence, um, uh, uh, good or bad, uh, it's there, uh, where many of these organizations are, are determining the, the policy, the generation plans. Um, the regulations, uh, working in conjunction with the government, and um, but not yet 
focused on the local, focused on building upon the local solutions. So this is where REAM uh, we have been working and and making step-by-step uh, -step progress on ensuring that, as as Rosie explained, ensuring that there is a local voice in the decision making. So. Uh, to give you a sense of this uh, great progress of mini grids, this, these are government figures. Um, there are thousands of diesel generators, and um, micro hydro numbers. Actually, we, uh, in doing a recent overview of statewide uh, projects, we know that there are over 6,000 units below one megawatt. Uh, this includes pico, micro, and mini hydropower, and gasifiers. Um, Although there are uh, less, less than 100, a few hundred gasifiers powering villages, um, there are thousands of gasifiers that run small-scale rice mills. And so this progress in Myanmar is actually a really unique case where it, it exemplifies what international aid seeks to do, uh, where, which is, you know, we want to invest in programs that can scale, self-replicate, that are sustained long-term. And in Myanmar, these 6,000 plus mini-grids, well, they happened without any technical uh, technology transfer, uh, without international funding, without scaled uh, policy, and yet the number of mini-grids that exist here far surpass what has been achieved in, in other parts of the region that have been funded for decades. So what is, what is the phenomena behind this great progress? Well, actually, um, they, I, I have now started calling them uh, local social entrepreneurs. They are uh, individuals that have decades of experience where they have self-financed uh, these projects. Um, and because they're self-financed, they have high productive end use and, and they use locally fabricated technology. Uh, if I were to describe here on the left is Uso Ting Ong. He, he developed his first biomass gasifier at the age of 20. And now in his 50, he's designed um, a no liquid discharge unit, which, uh, which he hopes will, um, will be used uh, across uh, um, to upgrade the many of these gasifiers that exist currently. On the right is uh, Utan Te. Uh, I will share more about his work, but he does solar PV with irrigation. And on the bottom are our rows, um, is a row of um, the, act actually the actors that I work um, most closely with are the small, uh, the micro hydro developers. Uh, there's Ukun Jo on the bottom right. He's in his 80s and still very much involved in his projects, wanting to improve them, uh, think about new projects. Uzamin is third is building the third generation of hydropower developers in his family uh, and working very closely uh, with communities and community-based implementation. Usain Tula on the left, um, we will take a closer look at his, uh, his quite inspiring work. So, um, yeah, as I mentioned, there is uh, Utante's solar PV with drip irrigation where, I mean, these systems cost no more than $5,000, but have great impact on the income generation uh, because they link directly to agriculture output. Um, he does this in an inclusive way, uh, which uh, involves all of the households uh, in this uh, the project vicinity, um, where he wants to ensure the water is used by all of the households. And sometimes this isn't possible. Sometimes you have uh, landowners um, that have more resources. And so he facilitates a way where there is inclusion of, of all of the users. Um, I will go through these slides more quickly due to time, but you can, uh, you're free to uh, contact me for questions. The biomass gasifiers, as I mentioned, they are, they're more or less the elephant in the room because uh, this mini grid technology no international donor wants to uh, wants to fund or touch these because gasifiers are known to be dirty. And um, I've only come across one so far that, that has been interested 
in gasifiers. But um, but in Myanmar, as I mentioned, there are over 10,000 gasifiers, and our developer um, that we work with, Royal Tulin, uh, the company founded by Uso Tingong, has developed a no-liquid discharge unit because he understands the need to upgrade the many gasifiers that exist, which are inefficient, um, costly for the end users, and uh, pollute water sources. So you can see here the many number of units that have been used for various productive end use. And um, Sitwe, the capital of Rakhine State, actually was electrified uh, by Uso Ting Ong for a number of years after the, set, after the national grid had been there. He rented the lines to provide 24-7 reliable power because the national grid wasn't sufficient enough. So it's an example of, you know, these are not backyard um, tinkers. They're actually um, small-scale utilities that have been electrifying rural Myanmar. And unfortunately, there is yet no quantitative figure on how many um, communities have been electrified uh, with these decentralized systems, even though there is this figure of 30% oh, of Myanmar is electrified by the, by the main grid. We should take a closer look at, at these mini grids. So, here we have the hydropower uh, developers. They have established ownership and financing models which customize uh, per based on each village and community that they work with. They say that there are different strengths and weaknesses and you cannot do each project the same way. You want to uh, figure out what's optimal for the end users. So to give you um, a quick example of um, of one of their projects which has been self-financed. Again, I will go quickly through these slides, uh, but to highlight, this is a 200 kilowatt project uh, that was um, locally built, it's a Pelton turbine, and out of the 2,000 households and the 14 villages that it provides electricity to, about 500 are connected. And you can see here that um, building a microhydro project has intense, um, for about, six months you can say there's intense uh, construction etc a lot of community mobilizing goes in before this happens and but eventually you you um, get the least cost um, uh, electricity production how did he finance this well the cost of the project was a little over four hundred thousand dollars he invested 15 percent and then he created a cooperative of shareholders that invested another 15%. And through understanding the socioeconomic conditions of the village and potential productive end use, along with existing productive end use, he raised uh, the other half. And then also it took a, a short-term loan. And yeah, the project has been paying back for itself. Uh, the grid has arrived, but it still breaks even. We are working to uh, to interconnect this project to the main grid so that the, the electricity that's generated isn't, isn't just uh, wasted, it can go back into the main grid um, because the main grid in this area actually doesn't work consistently. Uh, so here you have some numbers on, as I mentioned, he customizes uh, based on the hamlets um, and, and this is different from project to project, and there's just on the ground factors that come into play when, when he designs this. Um, but it's really impressive. In fact, I've visited many microhydro projects over the last 15 years, and I've not seen one that's so organized and technically really up to par. You can see the wiring, uh, there's meticulous uh, records kept for seven years since the project's been running. There's a staff of seven that manage this. And this is because Us Usain Tunla, as a developer, um, having invested the funds, created this cooperative, is accountable um, to ensuring the project provides 24 seven electricity and, and all the management processes that come in with it. So one might ask, um, after you see these productive end uses, the many different commercially based productive end uses. Um, here's some pictures. There are a number of water pumps, um, which uh, uh, they're air compressors that send air down these wells and water comes out and the water is sold to uphill houses. There's 
brick making, there are many restaurants, this peanut press um, is there, a couple of uh, pump stations and a telecom tower. How does one manage load in, in this village? And what he, he has um, is our voltage meters in each household and, um, and they, over meetings and user trainings, he has established this behavior that users understand what the voltage level is and use loads based on uh, how their neighbors are using. So to summarize, what kind of policy recommendations can be as supportive to local social entrepreneurs in Myanmar? One is to understand that it is much faster and much uh, more efficient to, to build on what exists rather than building a new grid and extending it to the rural area. So we have examples in China and Germany where there were many mini grids, just like the case of Myanmar, but the, these mini grids were connected, formed into regional grids, and electricity came much quicker at lower cost, and it's decentralized, which is really crucial in today's age of climate disasters. You, you don't want a single grid that shuts down when the disaster comes. So, and also to understand that uh, biomass gasifiers and microhydropower provide the least cost electricity per kilowatt. The role of these social, local social entrepreneurs is quite invaluable because uh, they are the ones that bring in the technical know-how but also understand cultural nuances, uh, community uh, structures to build on those existing structures to manage uh, the project in the end and they are essentially entrepreneurs so they actually don't they don't like subsidies and grants they they like the challenge of making their projects financially vi viable and because of this productive end use is ingrained uh, sustainability is is not a question i mean they they must provide 24 7 electricity in order to get the uh, payback for their investment and and then at the same time, they're working with communities that have finite income, right? So um, income grows very slowly in these marginalized areas. So they're not there to make huge amounts of money. They, uh, at, the, at the max, um, have 10% profits. Sometimes they have no profit. Sometimes it's negative if the community wasn't able to pay back. But they are here because they have this great drive to build their own technology which is reliable and can provide electricity to those that don't have it. And, and they've developed years of trust and networks on the ground. So we would like to see uh, these developers have uh, financing that allows them to scale. They, they want to upgrade their technologies, but in ways that are appropriate to the Myanmar context. And they really want to find ways uh, that projects can be financially viable both in very marginalized regions as well as those that have higher chances of productive end use. To tie it all together, where does, where does energy justice fit in all of this? And, um, you know, I, I had the, uh, I was fortunate to attend LCDN's uh, conference uh, a couple of weeks ago and it allowed me to think about uh, my own work and and understand where uh, this concept of energy justice falls. And so to start with, as I mentioned, um, the national policy is currently being developed closed doors by the government and international institutions. And we are working quite hard to knock on these doors, have them open dialogue uh, at the regional level, state level, national level. But it shouldn't have been like this from the start there should have been more of an effort but it's okay we are we're changing this step by step um we need to think beyond solar it's it's quite amazing that uh, there's so many there are ample donors that have now come to Myanmar. it's been kind of the new frontier of southeast asia and it's it's quite amazing that most of them don't understand technology differentiation they have this noble goal of being technology agnostic, and that's, that's really good. However, we must also understand the pros and cons of, and of each technology, and it's, it's doing a 
disservice to communities on the ground that have hydro and biomass resources, small scale, um, where if you're promoting solar in a place that has a micro mini hydro source, you're, you're essentially they're going to have to pay much more, 700, 600 chat versus 300 chat per unit. And, and the power output is likely enough for cell phone charging, lights, but if you want to uh, enhance their agricultural livelihood, which is how most of rural Myanmar makes their livelihood, you need higher amounts of power. So our donors need to think beyond solar to take time to understand. And then there's the inclusion of local actors. This, I think I spend most of my days on this, is um, overcoming language, cultural, institutional assumptions from both local and outside sources. And uh, we, again, step by step, we are overcoming all of these uh, barriers, but um, yeah, these are just uh, being noted uh, because they fit into this, um, what, what is equitable. And specifically between local and non-local private sector, there is a lot of inequity. You know, non-local private sector uh, can communicate in English very eloquently, PowerPoint presentations, papers, you know, financial models that are easily uh, communicated, but local entrepreneurs haven't functioned in this way. Um, they have been functioning um, in a bubble for the last 30 and 40 years where uh, things were not done in that kind of formal manner, yet they have strong ties with local decision makers. But uh, just because of their English speaking skills or this, um, uh, the way we communicate in the mainstream uh, formal development world, they it's quite difficult for them to meet that. And so we serve as intermediaries, but, but I would really like to see external actors make more of an effort to uh, understand local actors within their own communication frameworks. And then this idea of grants and subsidies, grants allow us to, uh, to include the most marginalized of, of communities. And, and that is very important However, what are, what are the impacts of grants and subsidies on financial viability? And what is the impact of financial viability on the longevity of the project? So you, I have in fact implemented 100% grant projects and sure the lights come on, but what, how long will they last? Where is, who is that person that will be financially accountable? And here's where the role of the social entrepreneur comes in and, and it's really, we are in a, um, a rich space here in Myanmar where the local social entrepreneurs do not want uh, seek grants and subsidies. Right now, that's the only option they have, but they constantly ask for banks to finance their work. They, they, they want to work um, in a space where their cash flows, their business models are evaluated. Um, and, and yet they want to serve the most marginalized. So, and then uh, this last point is that uh, we have now uh, many researchers approaching us uh, to partner with them on various different topics. And this is, this is really good for Myanmar. However, however, we have to go beyond publications and papers. We must think about what what does my research tangibly contribute to the on the ground scenario? Who, who needs to know the outcome of my research? And, uh, and it's been really great to have made new friends at the LCDN conference because um, for a long time I didn't see the change uh, where, where there could be research who were more action focused, action research focused. And, uh, and I see now that there is a space to uh, showcase the Myanmar progress and continue to build on it using academia. And uh, actually, yeah, this is at the end of my presentation. I have a number of mentors and colleagues that, um, that I've been learning from the last six months and I greatly value their inputs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dipti. That's 
just incredibly helpful. Um, I think all three of these presentations together today, I think we can see all of those combining um, to really um, to really show you know the the value. I mean, as Rosie was saying at the beginning, you know, the value of of really involving local actors um, and listening to their concerns um, first and foremost, um, whether that's at the uh, regional level, the national level, or kind of the international global policy level. So thank you so much, Dipti, for that contribution. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to do now, I know we're here at the end of the hour, but I do want to do at least one round of Q&A. Um, and if the audience will please um, just stay with us a few more minutes. I understand if you have to leave, that's no problem. But if you can stay, do stay. Um, because we'd love to hear um, more questions from you, or um, we'd love for you to hear the responses of Rosie, Sheikha, and Dipti um, to some of the questions that have come in, and a few others that I have on my mind. Um, so maybe we'll go first here to Rosie. Hi, Rosie. Are you there on the line? Hi. Hi. Hi, yeah. So I just wanted to come back around to you, really, because I think um, when you were talking about energy justice um, and it, the fact that it requires to think at different scales but can involve, also involve a politics of scale, I think this really closely links into what uh, Dipti and Shika were actually presenting just now. And I wondered if maybe kind of from, from this pr framework and kind of theoretical standpoint that you have, could you, could you kind of bring in a little bit of your perspective on the politics of scale and why that matters? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you're right that there are really, you know, important questions of scale arising from, from the presentations there. So what I mean really by the politics of scale well, some different things. One, one is that depending on the scale at which you are looking at things, then you might get a different sense of, first of all, what the justice questions are, but secondly, whether there is a problem or not. So if you think of renewable energy, and I use an example from India, and of course, Chika had a really interesting example from India there as well. And that brought up the issue of renewable energy often not having questions asked about it that might be asked at a local level because if you think of it on a more national and global level then it appears as a very good and quite just thing in that it's it's um contributing to low carbon development and of course you know helping to solve a lot of global problems so looked on at that scale renewable energy might seem as a really positive thing but this means that the analysis at a local scale sometimes doesn't happen and that means that we're perhaps blind to some of those injustices that can happen at a local level with that kind of development. So there's that sort of politics of where the benefits and the costs accrue, and these are not necessarily in the same places. And there are decisions about at what scale we choose to ask the questions. And then I think in what Dipti's presentation brought up to me, rather, it sort of resonated with a question that I have about how you cross scales. So I think there are issues of how to move up from the the local scale how we scale up effectively basically and issues about how people can be effectively represented once we move out of quite local level operations and you know really impressive things that are happening at local level about how to scale those up how people can be represented at bigger levels so i think this really includes having really good systems of representation so really thinking about how decision making forum might operate effectively at different scales and represent the voices of people that can make their way up from the local level to the grassroots, sorry, for, to the higher levels up to national and international policy. But I think there's a question which I don't have an answer to, but it's a really important one to, to ponder and to think about how we can build it in as how we create solidarity across scales. So I think at the local level, as, as Dipti's work's really shown, her examples there really show, when people are working in communities and living in communities, there's a lot more social capital. There's a lot more reasons why they might feel um, responsible, I guess, for that community and why, why people might act in these very, really quite altruistic ways and work for a community. But of course, when people are at a great distance or they're people we've never met, that kind of personal solidarity doesn't exist so much. So. I think there's a real question for research and for scholars and, and for all kinds of practitioners about how we can represent people in a way that creates solidarity and empathy and, and a desire for people to act on other people's behalf and to act ethically and to act in ways that are just when we don't necessarily know those people. So how, how perhaps to represent those voices and, and to build that solidarity. That's it. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you. No, that's really that's really excellent and really something to 
to think about. Um, I, I think that's that's incredibly compelling. This point about how, um, yeah, exactly. If people are not connected up, they've never met face to face, for example, um, and there's or there's maybe just a meeting between the locals and the the regional government or this type of thing. How do you then exactly create that sort of empathy and yeah, that willingness to work? Um, work together in, in their interests um, in particular. So it goes back to your question of who benefits, I think, um, and that's, that's yeah, definitely and one. It goes back to representation and, and representing people's voices and, and methodologically some of the things that we've been working with in different projects is, is for example, with narratives and, and for narratives to be able to travel. So I, I know that you're interested in stories, Molly, but you know sometimes personal stories can really help to, to create that kind of understanding and empathy, I think. so. So that's one way. So I, I do think there are ways to do it, but I think that's an area which would definitely benefit from more research, you know, to, to help justice to cross scales. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, excellent. Let me go um, now to Shika. Um, hi, Shika. Are you there on the line? I'll give you just a second. Maybe you can't um, can't hear me. Hi, Shika. Are you there? Okay, well, that's okay. It, it may be that she's on mute and, and can't come off of mute or something like that. We might just be having a little technical problem. What I'm going to do in that case is just um, pop over to, to Dipti and we'll come back to Shika. Um, hey, Dipti. Hi, Molly. Hi. So, I mean, I thought you might, uh, we have had several questions coming in, quite a few actually, and I have not had a chance to read every single one of them. I, I wondered, actually, would you care to kind of um, jump in on what Rosie was just saying um, in her comment. Yeah. I mean, especially about this question about, you know, linking up. I know for you, it's one of your your kind of personal passions is to figure out, you know, that that linkage. And I know you're working very hard at it and are having you're, you're having success. But it's also hard to kind of make that linkage between the local and all of those different levels where, um, you know, as Rosie said in her talk, all those levels are influencing um, you know, the local level in a lot of ways, but how do we get those voices um, further up? I know that's that's not a, a question to to answer today, probably, but do you have some thoughts on, on what Rosie was saying? Yes, I mean, just based on what I learned from local organizations here, such as the Mekong Energy and Ecology Network, uh, which has been really looking at how uh, the idea of commons can take root in national policy. And, uh, and so this is where uh, we realize that perhaps starting with uh, regional grids, mini grids going into regional grids, that is one space. Um, yeah, but, and the other, other uh, point would be to make sure that we're connecting all of the stakeholders, um, yeah, inclusive uh, learning and decision-making, um, understanding each other's uh, priorities, uh, both at the national level and local level. But um, yeah, it, it, it's really important to see how, how those on the ground are breaking these barriers. They, they would have the best answers. Okay, yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the key words for today coming out of all the presentations is this word inclusive, um, right? That's kind of like a, a core, um, a core concept that to me that's come out of all of the pre um, all of the presentations today and I've just seen as well um, Shika is online she was just having a little technical problem there um, so if you don't mind I will pop over to Shika hi Shika yeah hi can you hey. hear me yeah I can hear you now no worries yeah, sorry there was some technical problem but now I seem to be back on that, back into the webinar that's no problem that's no problem sorry um, these things happen so that that's that's not a problem um, I was wondering if you want to um, join in on this discussion that we're having you know kind of about inclusiveness I mean especially from the, the standpoint of your case study um, and we did have a question that came in um, that was asking okay so I'll, I'll i'll read the question to you but you're also free to kind of bring in what rosie and dipti have just been saying um so how do you see such resistance to new renewable energy plants um, in the face of massive energy poverty in india so do you think in other words do you think that there is a middle road is there a way that you know they can um 
they can get access to energy, but without giving up those other, um, especially the, the elements related to their livelihoods and the loss of the land and, and this type of thing. Um, do you think there's a middle road or what are you seeing so far um, in terms of what the, the local activists are doing? Yeah, so I think it's a great question because it also allows me to um, sort of bridge what Rosie and uh, Deepti had to say in terms of uh, inclusivity. So, um, so I forgot to mention, but this case study was part of my dissertation and some of my new work that I'm doing looks at the ways in which renewable energy projects can be reconciled with local livelihoods in order to come up with, you know, a solution that works for all actors, which includes um, you know, project developers, as well as uh, the people who are living um, at the local site of construction. So one of the projects, which is, uh, you know, what I'm pursuing right now is, um, you know, to sort of for the project developers to understand how is it that their project can contribute to development activities at the local scale. And, you know, through a series of negotiation or, you know, sometimes even intense uh, political wrangling and contestations to arrive at solutions that make sense for the local people as well for these large scale uh, project proponents. Um, so one area, for example, of uh, you know, some new work that's happening is that to look at mini hydropower projects and how is it that they can uh, sort of make sure that when the project is set in place that they do not um, um, you know, conflict with existing irrigation networks and rather reinforce the existing irrigation networks to make sure that the people still get the water for irrigation as well as the electricity from the project. So, um, you know, so then just sort of feeds into larger questions or issues about inclusivity and, you know, who is to be excluded, who is not to be excluded and so on. But I do think and I'm hopeful that, yes, there are ways in which one can reconcile um, large scale renewable energy projects with local livelihoods, provided there is political will to do so. Thank you so much, Shika. Well, that's that's really excellent, and I think, in a way, that's a really good um, stopping point. Although I have a feeling we could go on talking about this for quite a long time, <laughs> but I think that's a, that's a great stopping point to look at the ways in which projects, whether they're large scale or small scale, um, can take into account uh, the needs of the local communities um, and ensuring that they are they're they're not just getting access to energy, but they're ensuring that all the other resources that they rely on are also, um, whether that's land, whether that's um, the, the irrigation to the land itself, um, all of these things, ensuring that those things um, are theirs, basically, um, in some way, or can be shared in a manner that is uh, makes all the parties happy. Um, and so I think on that note, that's a great place to, uh, to close for today. Um, just a very final um, last closing point. Um, this is my last webinar um, for Smart Villages and LCEDN, but I want to thank everybody um, over the past year and a half who's been supporting this webinar and who's been uh, attending enthusiastically. And thank you all, everybody who's still on the line for joining us. Here today um, and as well um, so after the um, webinar closes there will be a survey for you guys to fill in so please do fill that in let us know what you thought of today's webinar if you have ideas for future webinar please send those in um, and the webinars will be continuing next month um, I believe probably at the end of next month so um, you know, best of luck and um, thank you all for joining um, let me say thank you to all of our presenters today if you guys don't don't mind coming back online. So um, Rosie, our first speaker, thank you very much. Shika and Dipti, thank you guys all for joining us here today and for such an excellent webinar. So I wish everyone an excellent weekend. Um, I know it's a uh, festival period where Shika is, so <laughs> happy festivities. Yes. Um, and uh, yes. apologies, yes. apologies for landing on a festival day. <laughs> but um, No problem at all, thank you. Thank you. So thanks everybody and um and goodbye. Goodbye.